hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. My name is Charles. With me, as always, is my co-host and lifelong friend, Dylan. Thanks for that, Charles. Uh, Yeah, we got a very special episode for you today. Very special. We just finished recording with Ben and Jake over at the Fantology podcast. You we were uh, super happy that we were able to work out this buddy read of Emperor's Soul with the guys at Fantology, and um, I was really happy with how it came out. I was too. I do have to make one correction, though, Charles. I know I'm going to take heat from you for even using this time to do this. Okay. But I, I think I said that something was anthropomorphized. I at do some remember point you this doing episode. that, yeah. And I meant personified, oh. and it's been. <laughs> bugging me for days and those are like opposites and it's like i think anthropomorphized is giving human characteristics to something that isn't human and obviously personified is pretty much like making a human example out of something that isn't just a human like an idea right i do remember you saying that actually i had forgotten and um now we can all as listeners wait for that moment when it comes up on the i show. know i'm like <laughs> I was literally for days, like I was like thinking about it, lying in bed at night. <laughs> Dude, I wouldn't worry about it. When we finished recording, I was very excited with how it went. I, I I think the I think the friends are going to be in for a treat with this one. Yeah, I mean, what more can you say than that we had Jake and Ben from Phantology on? I mean, they were just phenomenal and great super knowledgeable experts. of the cosmere yeah, as um, well which we greatly totally appreciated agree. um uh, as someone who's never read stormlight it was good to have um people like jake and ben on who are very familiar with sanderson's work and his world building and everything like that so they provided some very valuable insight into this episode and emperor's soul what a great little read highly recommend yeah. Well, well, and they're super nice dudes. Super so we nice will turn dudes. It, yeah. And we were we were on their show not too long ago. We were talking with Stephen and Josh about the two towers, which was so much fun. Those guys have shown us nothing but love, and we greatly appreciate all the support and opportunities they've thrown our way recently. Just super happy. Yeah, we have nothing but love in return for. I mean, everyone that we've worked with over at Fandology has been so awesome. Absolutely. So. Yeah. So yeah. Much love to Phantology and uh, any of y'all who are listening to this who haven't checked out that podcast, please, please do. You deserve it. You deserve it, man. If you like what you listen, if you like what you listen to today here at the end of this episode, then you're gonna love what they've got cooking over there. So definitely check them out. But first, enjoy a very exciting discussion of the Emperor's Soul by Brandon Sanderson. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy podcast. My name is Charles, and with me is my co-host, Dylan, as always. That's me. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with some friends here. Yes, we have friends with us. One of our very first features on the Friends Talking Fantasy podcast, we have two of the guys over at Fantology podcast. We have Ben and we have Jake. Hi, Charles. Hi, Dylan. Hey, guys. Hey. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much for being here. We're super excited to have you on the show. Yeah, we're excited to be here. Awesome. Yeah, for, for all of our listeners who don't know, Phantology is a really awesome uh, fantasy book podcast. They talk about all the latest books and series, and they're super knowledgeable. We were just on their show about a week ago to discuss Lord of the Rings. We were Super honored that of all the series to be on for a fantasy podcast, Lord of the Rings. I mean, come on. Uh, we we were very appreciative to be part of that. And uh, now we're excited to have them in kind on our show to talk about Brandon Sanderson. Yeah, we are huge Sanderson fans. And I'll, everybody know Jake is just like constantly on 17th Shard and just like <laughs> always looking up these like deep, like interconnected Cosmere things. So Jake is like our, our in-house expert for the Cosmere. I had a theory one time and I was like, I'm the only one who's ever thought of this. So I had to like read through to make sure I was the only one. And I was like 99% sure. And I like posted it and then 
like immediately was redirected to another post from years ago, <laughs> answering it. And I was like, oh, okay, never mind. So that's yeah, where they the don't bulk mess around my, on that page. <laughs> yeah, that's the bulk of my knowledge is from trying to, uh, to prove this theory that had already been disproven years ago. <laughs> oh, <So. laughs> Well, I, I have a feeling you guys are going to be a great authority here. I know Dylan and I would really appreciate having a couple uh, big Sanderson fans on with us to talk about Emperor Soul and to get kind of more into the Cosmere and things like that. Um, so, yeah, definitely check out Phantology. And uh, I don't know, guys, do you want to take a quick moment to just kind of explain a little bit more about Phantology or, or I mean, however you guys want to handle it? Mike is yours. Yeah, so we are a group of five friends um, who about a year ago now started just doing a podcast about fantasy books. We were kind of inspired by the Legendarium, and um, all of us had had spent quite a few of our formative years. We all went to high school together, and we all um, kind of started reading Wheel of Time and then got into Sanderson and kind of got, have grown from there. And so we just try and do two episodes a week talking about various fantasy books. So, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, we are no strangers when it comes to friends on the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. We've known each other for a long time as well. We lived right down the street from each other for a very long time. I'm actually impressed that you've actually managed to coordinate amongst five of you. I mean, <laughs> we're barely get by with two of us. I mean, we coordinate with all five of us maybe once a month. <laughs> the other times, yeah. it's, it's we take who we can get. <laughs> it is always yeah, a pleasure true. when the Phantology five all get together and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they, their show's awesome. Definitely check them out. If, if you like what we're doing over here, I am 100% confident you're going to like what's going on over at Phantology Definitely. and we're, we're honored to have you guys over here. So yeah. I'm pumped. It sounds like you guys are, are friends talking fantasy too. And uh, you're just creative enough to come up with uh, a name that <laughs> isn't exactly what you're doing. I don't know. I'm a fan of your guys' little logo. I've always yeah. been inspired by that. So That's Charles. Thank you. That. that was all me. <laughs> yeah. I picked the color. I picked the he blue. Did. Charles it wanted was, to go with this really it, puke green color. It was pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. It was an ugly green for a long time before we changed it. But yeah, it was inspired by... It's kind of like a combination of Tolkien and Wheel of Time kind of combined. Yeah. Yeah, definitely that JRR thing going on. I like it. I've always right. thought about the Weezer W when I see it. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it's a bit of Weezer W. Also, you know, it's a universal thing. <laughs> it's the Blue Album. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, and I always like you know the, how the two Fs made the T, and it was just it just kind of all came together by <laughs> yeah. accident. He was really into that. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you for noticing that. Uh, you guys recently in the Twitter world j just got a, a new intro uh, narrated. What you got some VO work, guys? You want to talk about that really quickly? Because I'm still like you just explained it to me, but I'm still like <laughs> impressed and in awe. <laughs> yeah. So Michael Kramer and Kate Redding were nice enough to narrate our intro for us, and um, with the suggestion that we always kind of try and tag their chair charity of choice which is books for prisoners and so that's the only requirement that they had is whenever um, we get a chance to kind of plug that charity so if you're looking for a good place to send some extra money during these crazy times um, books for prisoners is the place to go for that yeah definitely glad we got to put that in nice yeah books for prisoners Head over there, prisoners. give them money. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so that's awesome. So with introductions out of the way, let's now bring in The Emperor's Soul by Brandon Sanderson. Uh, this was my first read through of The Emperor's Soul. And Dylan, I believe it was your first read through as well, right? It's my first read through as well. And I, I think this closes out reading all of the Cosmere for me, Ooh, actually, nice. wow. except Arcanum Unbounded, which is on my, Ooh, okay. uh, I don't know if that, that might count uh there's I'll, some, there's I'll some in there yeah yeah <laughs> okay i gotta check that out <laughs> but yeah i this is my first read through and it was it was awesome I, a lot of people say that this is sanderson's best work in their opinion i've seen that a lot uh, i mean it was it was really good i might be a little partial towards some of the door stoppers <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah it was an awesome story <laughs> And Ben and Jake, you guys, um, you guys, this is not new for you. You guys have read this a couple times, right? Am I, is that right? 
Yeah, this was my third read through. So I read it awesome. once, like my first time. And then I actually, we were going on a road trip with my in-laws and I convinced them it was like exactly a four hour long road trip. And so I convinced everybody in the car that we needed to listen to it and people loved it. Unfortunately, um, that is not transferred over to the Cosmere in general, but it was well received. <laughs> and then I read it uh, once again in preparation for this. So, yeah, I read it. Have just... to take a long road. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> well, I was going to say you'd have to take a pretty long road trip to crank out any of the Stormlight audiobooks. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's that's a cross country for one yeah. book. <laughs> um, I read it just once when I think like a year after it first came out and really liked it. And it was fun. I listened to it the second time in preparation for this. And it was fun to um, it's like when you haven't seen a movie in a really long time that you really liked. You're like, I remember liking parts of it, but I don't remember why exactly. So it's fun to almost relive it. Awesome. Well, I'm really glad that we have people that have had a few read throughs on it on the of this book on with us. That's going to be really helpful. Um, the, I just wanted to introduce this book kind of by going into kind of Brandon Sanderson's inspiration for this book, because I, I think it's interesting. I always usually like to just kind of talk about the, the author's background. I think it kind of informs the um, the book as a whole. And Sanderson has gone on record as saying that uh, this book was inspired by a trip he took to a museum in Taiwan, all this famous ancient masterpiece artworks that he would notice that all the different artworks had seals on them. And in some cases, emperors would go and see these like masterworks and put their own stamp on the work. And he was just kind of so fixated on that idea. He thought it was so interesting that an emperor would see a beautiful piece of work and decide he had to put his own stamp on it and that kind of became the inception of this idea of forgery and soul stamps and and uh, this idea of rewriting the nature and objects of the existence of this object which was surprising for me like sanderson always is so good at this when he introduces a magic system it's always based in science and it always seems complicated but I'm following him every step of the way the way he explains it like kind of that show don't tell idea i mean he's a master i felt the same way when i was reading mistborn and they explained the magic system in mistborn also very scientific i was feeling that again i was like okay we've got stamps and they can change histories and i i my first impression was you know this is just sanderson in his element writing these like science-based hard magic systems yeah i agree with that i think that it kind of on that kind of the flip side to that coin is that he has so much knowledge of this kind of deeper overarching world that he's created. And so in his, this is kind of essential to know as you read um, through Emperor Soul is that there's three realms. There's the physical, cognitive, and spiritual realms. And each of those realms are kind of explored to varying degrees in each of his books. And so the fact that he's able to kind of draw on that wealth of world building that he's already done and condense it into this short story makes it feel very polished and he's able to do it in such a way that he's not like throwing a ton of information there. It's more, he's just like picking up um, little pieces that he's already developed in other places and, and working it together in this, in this short story. So. Yeah, I'd agree. I think it's cool. Um, speaking of the, the different realms and realmatic theory, I think from, this was my recollection when listening to it is this was one magic system that was a lot more spiritual realm focused than I think a lot of his other ones. Um, I, I could be wrong on that, but I can't think of another one that was so much uh, focused on the actual essence, the spiritual essence of, a, of an object and how that gets manipulated. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, Jake. It's surprisingly soft for Sanderson, where it's like, oh yeah, like I was able to turn that glass into a stained glass because it had a little piece left, and I could change its history. Like it, it it's looser than something like in Mistborn, just like here's yeah, these and here's their opposites, and you push and pull, and they do these things. It, it seems more open to interpretation of the possibilities of what you can do with this yeah. soul stamp system. But at the same time, like you said, he explains it in such a cause and effect mathematical way that you're like, oh, like, of course, you just have yeah, to kind yeah. of make that little jump. But yeah. 
One thing that I was kind of a little let down by, and maybe this is because there's just not enough pages in the book, <laughs> but there was never like a limit to her powers. Like she she never tried to do something and it backfired. And it was just, so I feel like normally in a in a Sanderson book, you kind of have this kind of ebb and flow of, of powers and trying to push your powers to a new limit and maybe like the powers backfiring on you a little. And we didn't really see that in this book. It was more, she just kept on pushing her limits. So, hmm. That's a great point, man. I didn't really think about that. Uh, it feels like uh, uh, maybe second or third read through realization, or maybe <laughs> you're just uh, a closer reader than I am. But I, yeah, it seems like there's these things presented like, oh, it would be really, really hard to be able to do that. And usually Shay is so good at that thing that it's like, oh, I just need some time and I would be able to do that. And we don't really run into any points in which that is actually overconfidence or anything like that, which would have been a kind of interesting thing to explore if we were attached to Shay's perspective and getting this like, well, I'm a master forger. I can do anything with the right time and materials and then see, oh, well, maybe not. But yeah, it's yeah. such a tight story yeah. in this I mean, there were we don't get few, there that. were a few moments where she was trying soul stamps on gautona and they weren't taking but then she immediately was like oh i know how to fix it you know yeah. i think mm -hmm. from the beginning she was presented as this savant master artist and she kind of remained that way and I think a large reason for that is one, it's a short book, so she just needs to be good. But two, I think it plays into one of the main themes of this book, which I guess we can, I would be curious to hear your thoughts, Ben and Jake, on what Dylan and I kind of identified as perhaps one of the main themes of this book, which is artistic integrity. This idea of like, this is a work of art. It's something that I have pride over, you know, this idea of self-expression while also trying to recreate an object and like she kind of needs to be a savant in order to have that higher sense of pride and to take on this in seemingly impossible task of recreating a soul. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, the whole artistic uh, integrity, like throughout the book, uh, Gautona, if I'm not sure how to pronounce that, I hope we're doing it right. Right. Um, Me neither. But. <laughs> he, he kept saying like, like what a waste of your potential. Like you have all this talent. Why aren't you just an artist? And I think like for Shay, her, like it was, she was being an artist by doing this. Her forgery was her art. It wasn't, you're being a forger. Why aren't you artist? in her mind, you know, those are the same things. Um, she, she brings up a good point where um, she replaced a painting with a fake or with a forgery and she's like, what does it matter if people still enjoy it for what it is? And forgers will be able to see it as a work of art in the realm of forgery as well. So it's like this double art going on there. Yeah, I really like how they also, like Sanderson was great in the fact that he took it one level deeper where he made the original artist commission her, or like, I mean, it made it sound like she was kind of his, I forget his name, but she was his apprentice almost. And then he asked her to destroy the painting and so then you have right. like this, this tug of war between like Gautuna and the the original painter, and like, is does the art, art belong to everybody that's seen it, or does it still belong to the artist? And you still like so there's so many different levels of yeah. is she an artist or is she a, does she just copy things? And then who does the art really belong to? And does it make a difference if nobody knows if it's a fake or the real thing? So there's there's a lot of levels there, for sure. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I think Sanderson uh, probably toys with some of those ideas as someone who is an author and releases books out into the world. And he's like, hey, do I still own this book? And, and we've definitely seen examples of authors that like to feel like they do still mm -hmm. very much own the book and retcon stuff and say stuff that uh, a lot of times fans don't like. Um, <laughs> and then we've also seen examples of people who kind of just put something out into the world and say, like, okay, it belongs to everyone who's reading it or in the case of maybe something Shay would create, like everyone who is looking at it and enjoying it. Yeah, one of my favorite things that Sander, I, I was reading Reddit and he posted on, um, I forget what Reddit subpage it was on, but he asked the 
mod for permission to post there. And the commenters were, one commenter was saying, you know, who, what author asked for permission to post about his own work? <laughs> and Sanderson replied saying, hey, look, this, this community is for fans. It's not necessary for me to come yeah. in and, and dictate. Mm. And so he's very co- cognizant of like, of that relationship of, of the fans kind of building a world for themselves that he can be adjacent to, but not necessarily dictate. I feel like very few authors have respect for readers like Brandon Sanderson does from how he communicates with his audience, from even how he writes of like, Mm -hmm. I got to make sure I keep the pace moving, that it's easy to understand, that I'm not going so deep into lore that you forget things, that I make sure the ending has a big payoff for the reader and things like that. It's like... For me, his reading experience, you're always kind of guaranteed a good minimum 7 out of 10 ride when you, when you go. that whereas uh the artist in the book is more like this was mine i don't like the way it's being used so let's destroy it right and i think one of the really interesting things that sanderson does is he basically has two main character arts when it comes to like artistic integrity and what is art and who is art for you have the main character right and Mm -hmm. she is uh, this idea of a forger where it's like my greatest achievement is to have something in plain sight that everyone believes to be real that isn't and then she learns to be more honest and Mm -hmm. you know kind of bend it a little bit for the greater good in terms of the emperor so like i kind of guided him a little bit he probably would have done it and then on the opposite end you have gautona who is like you know art is meant to be enjoyed it's a masterpiece it doesn't belong to you anymore and then in the end we know he like kind of comes around as well and he and he burns the basically blueprints to the emperor's soul where he's like some things are best left kind of as a mystery and should be be left back in history so i thought that that idea of artistic integrity how sanderson weaved it in in two ways and how they kind of how gautona and how do we say the main character's name i was saying shay Shay, how they um kind of ended up compromising and meeting in the middle with each other. It was very interesting. Yeah. I think that I love, first of all, I love how Sanderson never, he doesn't give any answers here. He just asks a lot of questions. So that's awesome. And I really, I, I also like how I love how Galtina is able to um, put aside his preconceived notions and (laughs) offer himself up as a test subject to this thing that he, he felt was evil and by the end, he's able to really read and appreciate her work for what it was. You know, when he's he's sitting there reading the Emperor's Soul, the book that she made for him, and he just is like reveling in how intricate and how it's like the greatest artwork that he's ever seen and how much of a journey that was from the beginning where he just didn't want anything to do with it. And he thought it was this blasphemy that she was doing. So it, I, I loved Gautana's art. I thought it was, yeah. I thought it was great. Me too. Yeah. And the parallel in the difference between how he reacts to her forged art and then how by the end he's reacting to her forged emperor. Like you get to see that transformation really, uh, 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 I guess through the emperor, almost anthropomorphized (laughs) where it's like, oh yeah, well, like here, maybe a little adjustment here or there isn't too bad. And and that's something that I'm interested in hearing 
y'all's opinion on i i know that uh ben you're saying that we we got more questions than answers uh, here and i'd agree with that especially around the decision that shay makes to basically nudge the emperor in a particular direction to be the man that he could have been uh, uh, basically to try to make him a better or more proactive emperor that stands up for his ideals and i'm wondering what y'all think since sanderson doesn't really give us an answer is that manipulation is it a fair move is it both yeah that is tough one thing that i will say is he set up shay's character he he foreshadowed that really well, right? Because like mm-hmm. even the oh, who's the kind of the skeleton caster, like the oh, the, the blood, blood caster, right? Blood the blood caster, and and she kind of even though she didn't like him, and it was she, he was the boogeyman for her. She still kind of nudged him, and in the end, tried to make his life better. And so we really do see Shay's influence both on the blood caster and on Galtina, like she always tried to make people the best versions of themselves. And so I thought that her doing the, that to the emperor kind of fit into that same a character that, that Sanderson developed for her. Yeah. And she kind of called that conning. Like she said, she conned um, Gautona by being honest, you know, which made, I don't know, kind of made him better. And then again, with the blood sealer, um, I think another big theme of this book is uh a person's identity and the idea mm-hmm. that I think everyone agrees that depending on who you're with, like when you're with your family, you're your uh, one version of yourself. When you're with your close friends, you're another version, you know, when you're at work, you're another version of yourself. And that, I, that idea is really hit on in this book. And then also the idea that every choice you make is like, they say something about it in the book, like, the first step on this path or I don't remember the quote, yeah. but um, mm-hmm. something right. Like, it's not like a detour. It's a gradual yeah. step in, in yeah. that direction until you find yourself looking for the trail again. Right. Yeah, I exactly. Remember that. Yeah. 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 Great quote. Thank you. I couldn't remember what it was, but yeah. <laughs> and so like we, we could all be so many different people while still being, I think the same core person. And it depends on the slight actions we make that lead us down these paths. Like you said, and then how we react to whatever we find on that path can like change us further. And I think that's, that was kind of the idea behind her nudging the the emperor is yeah. like, yeah, absolutely. Kind of resetting, like pushing him down a little, like some paths or helping him overcome certain things that had, I don't know, like uh, not galvanized. What's the word, uh, but had made him harder, you know? Right. But, that made him also more inclined to like like go out to dinner parties and things yeah and, and not kind of be more of a stern ruler yeah yeah I would also say like to play on the identity thing because they do do this thing of like to influence something is to kind of slightly change it the art of subtlety mm-hmm. and like the exponential mm-hmm. effects it has on influence but there's another like part of that that Sanderson works in, which like the way I've been kind of thinking of it in my head is like to change someone is to to know someone, right? Like she needs to have a very intimate understanding of whatever she's trying to influence, even slightly, right? So like even the the bloodborne guy who not bloodborne, a blood is it bloodborne? Uh, it's a blood I, I looked it up it's a blood sealer I think I said sealer. blood caster earlier so I <laughs> blood born a astray uh, so, I nudged them yeah. in the wrong direction yeah. there yeah, <laughs> so it was your fault um, yeah. <laughs> I'm bringing out the worst not the best like Shay would have but yeah like she even someone that she kind of did not like or was maybe afraid of a boogeyman like you said Ben um, she still had to kind of understand him and that he had like a romance like a a romantic partner off on far away back at home and that he was waiting for letters and things like that to the point where she was able to be like, you know, you should just go home. She doesn't care about how much money you're making. She just wants you back. So I thought that idea of like having to intimately understand someone to mm-hmm. um, influence them was a really interesting way to work with people and also with the inanimate objects like the walls and that she has mm-hmm. to know all the different gradations of limestone and to, in order to, in order to put a stamp on it. So I just thought that was an interesting part of 
Brandon Sanderson's magic system that was heavily woven into this theme of identity you were talking about. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I really love the fact that you can, like, if you understand kind of the, the deeper workings of the Cosmere, all that makes so much sense. And it's really cool that he's been able to make a story that both evolves this deeper magic system that he's creating and also gives you a very satisfying read, even if you know nothing else about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess one other criticism that I have about this book, though, I didn't love the various stole, soul stamps that that Shay had made for herself, only because we didn't really get to see the the kind of big one in action uh, of her um, alternate personality where she could potentially become a farm girl or I, I, the I, nuclear I option. wanted more of the mm. nuclear option. Right. I wanted that. I wanted something to happen. Either she destroys it, says she's never going to use it or she actually does use it. I just, and maybe we're going to see another story with Shay where she's having to confront that. I don't know. Yeah, um, it did. It did feel a little like a uh, Chekhov's gun that never went off. It's like you mm-hmm. spent a lot of time making sure that we understand that she has that nuclear option. And I guess you'd think it would play a bigger role than it ended up playing there. I guess the role it ends up playing is that she tells uh, Ganina, if that uh, is how we're saying it, uh, uh, Gayatona. Um, it's probably she tells <laughs> Gayatona that uh, she is going to make him a character in yeah. that st- story basically a kindly grandfather and i guess that means a lot to him but i feel like yeah you didn't need to flesh out the nuclear option to establish that that was kind of the relationship that got developed there so I- i'm with you on that one uh ben i'm uh, i guess i was expecting a little bit more I, I saw yeah. all her different soul stamps is just uh, a really good way to dive into her character and show like give more depth to her character you have the like her tough side and then her more sensitive side and then the side where it's just kind of like a reset and i i thought it gave her like a good sense of vulnerability um Mm. so i i really liked it i i like the kind of the mystery it left at the end of whether she'd ever have to use it and i was kind of thinking the whole time like what why you know still why would she ever want to use this what would cause her to want to do that but right i also saw it as another way sanderson was explaining the magic system without Mm. going into straight up telling us how it works like and to also kind of hint at the potential of it i mean like when when we read through mistborn right we it was our second read through when we read it for the show and you start to see how he was dropping clues in for right. big reveals later in the book so this time around i was like is this a clue like is this going to get subverted somehow like is someone going to use this stamp against her like you start to you start to get the wheels turning because like you guys said so much mm-hmm. time was spent talking about this particular version her mm-hmm. this particular stamp this particular version of her so i was like yeah i guess it kind of whimpered out you it was a nice gesture that he got the the un- the the cool uncle role, but uh, <laughs> it, it seemed like it didn't kind of pay off from all the buildup we got. But you know what? It doesn't always have to work that way. It, 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 it was just nice to see the ways in which stamps can work. And I do also like how, like, you know, the, it's broken into chapters, which are the days and she has a hundred yeah. days and it goes from um day 40 to day 70 and i like how like one of the ways sanderson establishes how much time has gone by between day 40 and day 70 is how much nicer shay's room gets yeah it's like oh yeah like i decided to make the bed more comfortable i started to put in stained glass windows but every time they open the door they're like what did you do to the wall you know so it's like that was a fun way that we were able to get that sense of of time and to get to see again how the stamps are used to do things that had a little more of a payoff to it but all in all it was all kind of worked into like introduced because for me this was a introduction into a lot of the cosmere and into um this the the the, um physical cognitive spiritual realms you guys are talking about this is my first foray into that so i guess i kind of appreciate it as like okay we're seeing what's out there and what's possible and i'm understanding it i'm ready to go It it did seem like this this uh 
I can't remember if it's a short story or a novella or really what the difference is. But anyways, this story <laughs> is kind of framed around the idea of explaining to the reader what is like the the soul stamps, what is this magic system, how can it be used, and then sprinkling these themes that we've kind of talked about. Um, before we go away from the soul stamps, or I just wanted to mention, and no spoilers, I'll be sensitive here, but <laughs> when Shade breaks out her own stamps, um, just the fact that she had these different versions of herself at the ready to go definitely reminded me of somebody in Stormlight. Mm-hmm. And I wonder... I wonder if if they were influenced by each other or their independent ideas, like if Brandon had this idea first or um, the other character first or how that came to be. But. Yeah, Jake, it is interesting how you can start to see some parallels and uh, themes yeah. that Sanderson likes to explore. And this is definitely one. And I, I feel mm-hmm. the same way about the character that you're talking about yeah. now, uh, Stormlight. And uh, I... Another thing that popped up for me, especially around the thing that you were saying earlier around nudging people uh, and kind of trying to nudge them in the right direction, typically, is it felt like it raised uh, some similar stuff that comes up around Breeze, actually. Yeah. Mistborn, too, where it's like, uh, like, are you manipulating them? Is this kind of messed up? Or are you just doing the same things that someone who didn't have magical powers, but was pretty persuasive and can influence people that way is doing? It's yeah. uh yes. Yeah, Anderson touching on some similar things, but it does feel like even when he revisits stuff, he, he's able to find some new interesting ways to bring more depth to it. He does always mm-hmm. seem pretty pro manipulation though. <laughs> he does seem to come down a little on that side. Sometimes. I, I feel like Emperor's soul was less pro manipulation than breeze. For example, I agree. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> but they both do yeah. kind of talk like hint at this is free will really like a thing or are we all just reacting to other things, you know? reacting yeah. to soothing or high charisma roles or whatever <laughs> yeah and does the ends justify the means right what yeah. Shay did will probably make a lot of people's lives better it'll probably improve the empire it'll probably make the emperor more in line with who he would have wanted to be anyway yeah but Through is her it lens. her place to make that yeah i guess that's a good yeah. point Jake. yeah <laughs> but even if that was all true is it worth it? And is it something that is fair to do? Yeah, That's I feel like Breeze plays pretty fast and loose with the manipulation. <laughs> he doesn't really think about it too hard, where at least Shay has that artistic integrity we're talking about, where she actually wants to recreate an honest interpretation of the emperor, yeah. not exactly just create an emperor that will go fetch her a beer whenever she's thirsty. Speaking of one thing. Oh, go oh, ahead, sorry, Go ahead. I was, one thing that's interesting, though, is because we see that Gautana kind of tried to do the same thing, only failed at it, right? Like, mm-hmm. he tried to kind of nudge and manipulate the emperor his whole life, right? And he kind of, he got him to to become the emperor, but past that, his, his, kind of, his, his nudging kind of ended up in a spot that he, he didn't want it to. And so you kind of do get this idea that, you know, we can try and help people or nudge them along but sometimes they're gonna end up making choices we don't like yeah and i think the the difference here is that in that case there was the option to do that right like (laughs) in the way that shay does it there's no option of how it will or won't work out Mm -hmm. and it, it was interesting to me to listen like to have shay being like, oh, yeah, years later, this will start to happen. It'll kind of slowly <laughs> creep up. I'm like, oh, my, you've just set this person's path in motion exactly the way yeah. you want for years. I love how she, during her escape plan, she couldn't help but see if it worked, too. Like, going yes. back to that, yeah. I, I, I clumped that in with artistic integrity, right? Like, sure. she she wanted to be faithful to it, and she wanted, like, she she wasn't just trying to figure out how do I get out of this? This was yeah. an artistic problem she wanted to solve and she needed to see if she did it right. Like what the outcome was. 
for yeah, sure. Well, and to... yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so I was gonna say, going back to Charles's point of of having this kind of countdown, and we see this countdown fighting against her desire to finish out this work. Like she she had this plan in place to escape, but she couldn't bring herself to do it. And so I feel like the countdown and her artistic desires kind of really played off each other to make for a compelling story. Yeah, I totally agree. And I love how you get to see in Jay's perspective, how she's kind of rationalizing it to herself throughout. (laughs) She's like, Oh yeah, no, I mean, I probably could wait another couple days. And (laughs) I mean, it'd even be better maybe if I waited then and then tried to escape. Yeah. It's like, and when push comes to shove, it really is that artistic integrity piece uh, that uh, Jake was talking about that you just end of the day, you've been working on this thing so hard and you care so much about uh, the art that you make you just gotta see it through (laughs) right and she had multiple times she's she could have escaped started her escape plans on like day seven she's like now's the moment but she hesitated and she's like why did i do that and she's like well i know why because i this challenge is too tempting to to pass up and walk away from and there's this really great moment where she goes into the emperor's room and there's this quote where it's i wish that i could know you not your soul but you I've read about you. I've seen into your heart. I've rebuilt your soul as best I could. But that isn't the same. It isn't knowing someone, is it? That's knowing about someone, which I think is another like huge theme of this book where it's like, I know of you, but I don't know if this will work. I don't know how you will handle this. If it will take, I don't know about you mm-hmm. as a person now. So it's a very interesting kind of dichotomy there (laughs) yeah like she knew him well enough to recreate him basically but she's acknowledging that even though she kind of recreated him it's more like jump-starting this person and you know he he's not just going to be a copy of her stamp he's his own person right and there's something about like knowing all the details about someone, but there's still that magic piece, right? Because it's the yeah. emperor's soul. And it's like, what is a soul? Is it something that you could read all of his journals and talk to all his buddies and read the history books and be able to repeat? Or is there always going to be that piece of humanity, mm-hmm. of soul that we kind of leave to chance and put a little artistry into to make happen, which is a very interesting um part of it and i think sanderson using this kind of idea of an artist making a soul and having that artistic interpretation is important because just analytically trying to one for one copy the soul you're going to leave some pieces out not everything you can record in data form or in a journal form so she had to kind of get creative with relationships and things like that so it's a very interesting look into not just artistic integrity and identity but also kind of like what is a, a soul <laughs> a very heavy question this is, in this very small book <laughs> have, have you guys read uh speaker for the dead by orson scott card no no tell us about it um the, the the role of the speaker for the dead is like to go around and just get to know the deceased person so well and then speak at their service in a way where you're not just giving a eulogy but you're just basically recreating like giving details of all their strengths and weaknesses and just giving like letting people understand like who the person was um and it kind of reminds me of that where she had to just get to know him and a theme in that book as well is you can't like get to know someone 100 percent without just coming to love that person because you see all their flaws but you see all their motivations that led them to those paths. You see like all their desires and, you know, going back to what uh, Charles said at the beginning, where in order for her to get to know these people to kind of con them, she has to love them. It like, you have to be on that level in order to that understand them all. Well understanding of them. Yeah. 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 So kind of fun fact, you brought up Orson Scott card. So Brandon Sanderson was actually Orson Scott card student at one point. And oh. so, yeah, it's kind of the, uh, they have that relationship with each other. And and you can kind of see that sometimes in Sanderson's writing, I think. Um, hmm. Yeah. So nice fun fact. That yeah. Nice fun fact. Yeah. Yeah. 
Huh? Well, we're lucky to have you guys and your <laughs> vast knowledge on Brandon Harrison and the Cosmere over here. <laughs> yeah. So one question I had, Jake, I was meaning to ask you about this. We know that this book is set in Cell, right? Uh-huh. Which is actually which is the same planet that Elantris takes place on. I'm not sure. Elantris was the first Cosmere book that Sanderson wrote, and it's the first one that I read. So it's been years since I've read it. Is this a long time after that? I mean, I have a hard time really understanding how those two magic systems relate to each other. So have, have you guys read Elantris? I have. I have. Okay. Um, We're hmm. split down the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Should we get Charles to mute himself? <laughs> I'll be a good test for the audience here. I'll, I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll be more vague, but um, both both magic systems, uh, the the soul stamping and uh, forgery and blood sealing, all that, and the the aeons from Elantris, they both have to do with uh, these symbols or like in the stamp, it's, you know, how you create the stamp. Um, and they both have cores to them that are very similar without going into spoilers. Um, I never thought about it this way, but on Coppermine, they said that it's meant to reflect computer programming and i have like a a small grasp of computer programming Mm -hmm. so i i didn't catch that similarity until reading this um but how it's like these basic building blocks and it's um it's like each magic system on cell is like a different computing language Mm -hmm. so uh the aeons could be like python and then i know from my research of this book that there's um the fool character that comes up and that's actually a character that's directly referenced in another book that I have not read. It was originally supposed to be Hoyd and Hoyd makes appearances in a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of right. that pretty much all the Cosmere the books, right? Like, unless the person's immortal, it would it would maybe yeah. link the timelines a little Hoyt bit. Hoyd is very old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I, they wrote, I, yeah, they wrote out, uh, or Sanderson wrote out that it, the fool was Hoyd in here because apparently the alpha readers didn't like that. So, oh, really? Uh, well, they wrote yeah. out the scene that kind of embellished the embellishes it, but I think the character is still the same, right? I thought, yeah, I we just don't know for sure that yeah. it is Hoyd, at least from the context of this book. But maybe I, I, I want to defer to uh, Jake over here. He's the expert on this. I, I think it is supposed to be Hoyd. Um, right. And going by that, then I think this takes place uh, after Elantris, but like, okay, not not a long time after. Sorry, my explanation got way nudged <laughs> off the rails. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, so, so that's is... how this the magic okay. kind of relates in the time period. Okay, so this isn't like H three Cosmere, like I don't think so. It's... Okay, I, I could be wrong in that, but I don't think so. <laughs> they no, because they said. There's going to be an Elantris too, and he's toying around with the idea of Shay or Shai, whichever, um, being in that book, or oh, at least okay. or or referenced. And I had this idea of what if, what if she's just this, she's gone nuclear and she's just this farm character right. that you come like across, she's like <laughs> hosting an inn or something. That, yeah, that they, yeah, yeah, and that's like her that's reference, funny. which would be sad, but also kind of cool to have that <laughs> yeah. be um, her cameo. It'd be interesting if she was very happy as the farm character or farm girl character or whatever it was, right? Yeah. I think that could raise some cool questions. Because uh, like ignorance is bliss kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like because she, she, you know, she's taking some huge risks. She's getting herself in some rough situations like being on death row. And <laughs> sometimes you do really do wonder if she's actually <laughs> happy with like, I just feel like she loves the artistry of it yeah. so much that she couldn't be fulfilled without it. That's my that, takeaway. But it. if she didn't know feel. about it, that is that ignorance yeah. is bliss. Oh. Yeah. She's just like, like a could be cool if, painter. What if under, like, like, what if her personality fought to like escape that farm girl girl well, role? Like even though she like knows herself so well and she's like set all these safeguards, what if I don't know? Like that could be a compelling story too. Well, wouldn't the stamp sure. just not stick then? We would just I don't know, Mr. <laughs> well, well, isn't that kind of isn't that the kind of idea if it's like so fundamentally against the core of that person, like it's not a plausible 
change than it would. A soul stamp paradox. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting that when she when she takes on the other persona that can fight, she is vaguely aware that Shay. I know she built that into that yeah. soul stamp, but that Shay would want certain things and even listens at times. Right, that's why she tries to give a helpful nudge to the blood sealer is because she's like, oh, Shay would probably be upset if I didn't do this. Charles, you need well, to read we know Stormlight. That this t- <laughs> right, I did not read Stormlight. No, you, no. You need yeah, to read he's it. saying you need to. Oh, I know, I know, I know. I need. To, there's a lot I need to read. I need to read Stormlight, Elantris, I need to read Fountainhead and Speaker for the Dead. I need to read all these things. I don't know if you no, need to read Fountainhead. Yeah, don't read but... Fountainhead. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you need to read 4,000 pages to prepare for this, like, 300-page novella. (laughs) I will say, well, I'm curious maybe in a little bit getting into where you guys as such well-read Cosmere fans kind of rank this in it could be fun to do even a little uh, Cosmere ranking system here. Yeah. I'll, I don't know if you guys need some time to think. <laughs> I kind of just guys. threw this on you. <laughs> I, okay, so I will say that if I was if if somebody asked me, say they've never read Sanderson, and they asked me what book they should read first, my old answer would have been Mistborn. And yeah. if they've if they've like already read Wheel of Time or something, I would say Mistborn. But like if I know that they have maybe read Harry Potter and that's it, then I would say pick up Emperor's Soul. And if you mm-hmm. like that then read other Sanderson books. If, if, if you found it intriguing, but you weren't like totally into it, then don't go through the trouble. You know what I mean? But so I would say as an intro to who Sanderson is and his writing style, this is, you can't beat this book. That yeah, is really true, acceptable. Ben. It is a pretty low barrier to entry for this one, right? right? You could read it in an evening and get a good sense of Sanderson style right off the bat. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I really like all his short stories, honestly. Um, mm. Probably my top three are this one, Six of the Dusk, and what's the uh, the Silence, Shadows for uh, Silence, and the Forest of Hell. I think that's what's called. Super <laughs> long title, but this is one of like you guys are saying. It's so accessible. It's just you dive right in. It's very, the plot is compelling, but it also makes the magic system understandable and compelling at the same time. Yeah, it won. It won like the Hugo short story. It did. Or something. Yeah, uh, yeah. For uh, best novella, I think in 2013, if I'm remembering correctly, which is that's really high honors. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it was. I felt like I would have liked to have read this before doing Stormlight. Uh, mm-hmm. After I finished yeah. it, I even even just as you guys have been talking about with how succinctly and well the whole three different realms concept is explained Mm -hmm. and i won't spoil anything about stormlight but obviously (laughs) as a part of the cosmere that it has a role and it felt like i would have come into stormlight with just like a very good simple understanding of those things rather than uh I, i think he does a little more of just like yeah this is happening now and okay in stormlight yeah. than he does in emperor's soul i i i loved um shay's explanation to to gatsuna how she was like this exists regardless of if you believe it and she's like not interested in trying to convince him that it's real you know what i mean she's like yeah you can go on believing that the st- that 50 different suns rise every morning or whatever <laughs> whatever his belief was he's like like a new sun this- rises every day it's never the same <laughs> right. one right <laughs> yeah exactly and it's it's just a, such a cool like like she's not out there to be like this minister of the of of the three realms. She's just like, hey, this is how I'm explaining how I'm doing it. It's up to you if you want to believe that explanation or not. Yeah, it's funny juxtaposed against that whole sun thing, which is uh, yeah. you've got uh, uh, Gaudena saying that. It's like, oh, yeah, you're like wacky belief system. And she's like, my wacky belief system is stuff that can actually do consequential things in the real world. And yours is focused on there being a bunch of different sons. It's like, how can you think that I'm the one with the weird belief system here? (laughs) Yeah. 
and she never takes it too personally either. I think it comes from having a, a very strong understanding of everything and everyone. <laughs> yeah. And security and knowing that you're the right one. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, so, I kn- oh, go ahead. I was, well, this is one thing. I feel like one of my criticisms of this book is that every character was kind of a Mary Sue in their own right. Right. Like you have Galton, who's kind of a Mary Sue. You have Shay, who's kind of a Mary Sue. Like, each of these characters, and, and we we talked about this kind of with, with Shay, how she kind of like never hits her limits or whatever. But that kind of bothered me as well, even with Gautana, how he's always able to humble himself just enough to um, to understand Shay's perspective. Did, did that bother you guys too? Well, no? it's interesting, Ben. You raise uh, a complicated subject for us at the FDF podcast. We've been toying yeah. around with the idea of like, Mary Sue and its applicab- like applicability and how helpful it is because we feel like especially after having read the King Killer Chronicle and uh, <laughs> we dove yeah. into all the online discussions <laughs> around it and we've been wondering and I'm curious to hear from you guys too about this while we have some uh, awesome knowledgeable guests on it's like uh, sometimes we wonder. Is the Mary Sue thing like keeping us from just stepping back and saying like, okay, wait, but was the book good? Was the character good? Was the it's like, because uh, like Quoth is uh, almost the poster child of this at this point, and it's like part of what makes him an interesting character is that he's kind of a Mary Sue that we know from the beginning. This is not a spoiler. We know from the beginning has kind of this tragic thing that happens right. to him that creates a frame story so it's like yeah what do you guys think about that yeah the term i'm very Sue. curious but i yeah. do want to put it in context uh, sure. of shay first <laughs> and then get your opinions because and also dylan just to put your mic out like a little like an inch away from you <laughs> kind of yeah. a little bit. uh but um so for me for shay like when it comes to a mary sue like a mary sue for me i have a very extreme like very few characters are mary sue in my world you have to really have unearned powers that kind of break the storyline like for me very very mild spoilers for star wars right but you have ray who's never flown the millennium falcon before who's lived in a desert and she's out maneuvering tie fighter pilots and she rerouted the electricity of the millennium falcon diverted power and she picked up a lightsaber for the first time ever and she's holding off someone trained by luke skywalker so it's like yeah that's kind of like mary sue yeah. level but i think for the <laughs> sake of the story of emperor's soul shay is a talent and a perfectionist with a very high, high level of integrity for her art. And she has to be super good in order to have been put in this situation of being the only person ever to create a soul and to create a soul in a hundred days when she was expecting years and years. So, and it's from the very beginning, we know that she's an expert and she's had years of this and she kind of gets hints at her training and stuff. So for me, I can kind of forgive it. It is a story about a perfectionist being a perfectionist. So there is kind of, I get where you're coming from with that. And maybe more so with Gautona, where he also is a character who doesn't do much wrong in this and is very understanding in a position you'd expect someone to be kind of super biased. Um, But he is a political leader. He's right hand of the emperor and he is learning this whole time over a hundred days from Shay. And he does, he's just trying to appreciate what's happening because he cares about the emperor. So for me, that idea of Mary Sue kind of doesn't apply for me in this case, but I get that because it is a book about perfectionists that I can see where you're coming from. But for me, and I'm curious to hear what you guys think about the whole mary sue thing like dylan was saying but that's just where i'm coming from for emperor soul i that's I, actually yeah i think you changed my mind so i'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> yes to dylan we did it <laughs> <laughs> one at a time i i agree with you um but also when i'm reading or watching something it's i never really think about the mary sue thing until after like i have to take mm-hmm. myself out of it like with with the ray yeah. thing i never would have thought to call her a mary sue until right. people did and then i'm like oh yeah i never really feel like she's not going to be able to do anything i'm always like okay sh-. you know like it's just the ex- expectation 
she solves the problem and there's no like right. tension there. But with, with this one, I, I agree. I don't think she's a Mary Sue. I think she is talented. And the fact that it, I felt the first time reading it, there's this tension. Is she going to be able to do it or is she just going to figure out a way to escape? You know, like, yeah, there's this tension there, the suspense uh, with Gautona, I guess I never really would have thought he was a Mary Sue just because he's a secondary character. So in my mind, it's like, whatever. <laughs> but um, I guess he could have done something more like Javert with his uh, hate for the soul stamps. Like it could have been cool if at the end he's like emotionally crushed that this emperor who he loves is tainted by this his creation or whatever but right. that's kind of a different feel than the, yeah. the story was going for but and I the forgery see- wouldn't have been complete yeah yeah you know, <laughs> he, like, he like tears out the stamp or something and like demolishes her work i mean that would have been a twist yeah, yeah if he yeah. grandstands and kills the emperor anyway yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah I, I do feel I, i'm with what all you guys are saying i i do feel there's a little sense here of uh Gaetona as kind of just like this paragon of moral virtue and like only does good things all the time. And then the, it's kind of contrasted with Frava, who's just like yeah. pure bad and evil. Mm. And I think as someone who's more attracted to morally gray characters, that mm. was a bit of a downside. I know yeah. you only have so much time in this novella to hash out the nuance and, and Shay right. feels a lot more nuanced, but I, I definitely see the criticism that you're getting at there, Ben, and I think it's a it's a valid one. I, I think especially with uh, Guy Tona, if I can ever say that correctly, um, <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, where it's like, okay, like your thing is that you're just genuine all the time, but you're so good at being genuine that you can manipulate people with it. It's like, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, like I get yes. why you're in this, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> but yeah. So maybe maybe not so much Mary Sue is maybe one dimensional, which probably could yeah. be forgiven for for yeah. being a novella. It's just like reading other Sanderson works. Like you have characters that like are dealing with like crippling depression, and you have like all these mm-hmm. like like these deep seated like multiple like just parts of your personality that you're trying to grapple with, and and we didn't see that. And again, I can forgive that because of the format of the book. Um, right. It was just. I wish it left me wanting more. I'm like, I just want to read about what Shay does after this, you know, and, and get to know her better. That's fair. I mean, you also have, to be fair, Sanderson also has side characters like Ham and and, and yeah. like <laughs> clubs and people like that. I mean, they exist. I, I think it's just the nature of you, you have a, you're a side, you're a, a B character in a novella. Like you can only get <laughs> fleshed out so much. He was important in that he goes through the same um, arc that Shay does, just coming from the opposite direction, which is interesting yeah. to see. Um, yeah, I, I do kind of get that sense that he's a little bit more one dimensional, where at least with Shay, uh, like, like Jake was saying, you don't know if she's going to escape or if she's going to commit to the task. Like she's smart enough to know that, this task is impossible, but she's also so smart that she takes it as a challenge that she can't resist. So kind of balancing that, it was super interesting. And we just didn't have that same kind of nuance to any other character in this book. But yeah, And, and I say that we don't have a lot of nuance, but we spent a, like... The book was four hours long recorded and we spent an hour talking about it. So obviously like, but there's a lot of nuance no, yeah. there that, you know, that they fit in. So. Very true. No, it's brilliant. And well I know said. at the, by the end of the show, you guys like to do a top three, bottom three, but there's only two char- two main characters in this whole book. Uh, you could rank them, I guess. You're going to have to throw the blood sealer in there just to fill out <laughs> the, the list. And no or the random that. soldier that has this irrational hatred of Shay that could just... Yeah, the captain Shay. guy. Yeah. <laughs> Zoo, speaking of characters that were a little one-dimensional. Yeah, he has like a zero power main ranking. purpose <laughs> in life seems to be to try to kill Shay, and it's like... Dude, don't you have like hobbies or anything like anything else to do with don't yourself? Don't you still have to protect people? <laughs> yeah. he, he gets defeated by a bed. I mean, <laughs> yeah. You, you, like, yeah. <laughs> hate to see it. Yeah, hate to see it. it was a fun like because I was wait. I was like, I'm waiting. I wonder how Sanderson's gonna pull off his famous Sander Lanch in a, in a novella. Yeah. So it was cute to see how he had. 
those callbacks to things like crawling under the bed and changing certain mm-hmm. things and ha- noting that there was mildew and stuff. So uh, it was fun. <laughs> that, yeah, definitely the bed is probably fun. close to the top three. <laughs> 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 Just for lack of numbers. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, guys, do you have... um? Any last parting comments, thoughts, ideas about the Emperor's Soul or the Cosmere at large before we call it a day? Yeah, if, I mean, I guess hopefully you haven't listened to this if you haven't read it yet because we just spoiled the whole thing. But right. <laughs> I think that this is a great book, like I said earlier, to recommend to your friends if you want to get them into fantasy and you need like this easy access point. Can the Emperor's Soul, and I, I don't think you'll regret it. Yeah. I, I it's just really accessible. I, I think we've all said that, and it, it's just a showcase of Sanderson doing culture so differently, which lead to the, the magics being so differently, while still ha- having really relatable characters. Yeah, I was gonna. I, I sorry, I know that we're kind of running out of time. Keep rolling, hey, keep let's roll. keep it rolling, man. We're, as long <laughs> as you guys are happy, we're happy. <laughs> I think that. Um, it is so hard nowadays to not appropriate cultures. And that is something that I think is just amazing on how Sanderson did this, where it didn't feel like he was trying to do that. You know what I mean? Like it definitely, like you could tell that he was speaking about a culture and he definitely took elements from it, but it was all in really good taste. And yeah, I don't know. I, that's such a hard line to walk as an mm-hmm. author. It was definitely and more of a, really well. like an inspiration rather than a, than like, like in Game of Thrones, you know, the Dothraki are the obviously like based off of Genghis Khan. You know what I mean? Like that kind of thing. Like that's just an obvious one to one. Whereas this was more and it's like he saw something, it inspired him. And it's I don't know. Totally agree. Felt it was lovingly inspired mm-hmm. without ever feeling uh, icky or anything like yeah, that yeah. in how he was using the elements he was inspired by. Speaking of the different culture, for some reason when I was remembering this book, I thought the blood sealer was a wolf person. I was like excited to get to the wolf person part of the book. And I was like, Oh, he's just, he just has, he's just white with red eyes. Like, I don't know why (laughs) in my memory, it somehow got corrupted to be a wolf, but you've read wheel of time too many times, Jake. (laughs) So that was my disappointment this time around. No wolf, no, not thing. enough wolf man. That's fair. <laughs> not enough wolf man. Yeah, I was disappointed by that too. <laughs> <laughs> Would definitely spice a few things up if they yeah. replaced some of these one dimensional guys with wolf men instead. <laughs> Would have yeah. made it a little more exciting. <laughs> Zoo should have been a wolf man at the very least. It's like, if you're just going to spend the whole time drawing your sword and saying, I'm going to enjoy killing you, <laughs> it might as well be like wolf fangs (laughs) and then it might be more believable that he just lunged on the bed (laughs) (laughs) but no i agree with you guys this was a great um great work of sanderson brandon sanderson somehow just always he's got to be the least controversial fantasy author in the game he just always writes really relatable characters every world every magic system every character is so uh genuine and and unique and created to tell the story that he's crafting and it it it, um it's just really pleasant to read like we've we've the first book series we ever read was Mistborn. And that's because Dylan and I, um, like you were referencing Ben, it was always kind of our go-to recommendation Mm -hmm. for just modern fantasy at large, because Sanderson just has a way of writing for the reader. And this is perhaps an, like you were saying, an even more accessible uh, gateway into not only Sanderson's work, but into um, high fantasy at large. And I think, you wouldn't be making a mistake starting here by any means. And as coming from me, as someone who hasn't read a lot of the Cosmere, I thoroughly enjoyed a lot of the components of this. And I'd be excited to go back and reread it after, um, after checking out Stormlight. That's definitely the biggest gap in my, in my reading library. So um, no, I, I loved it. Fun experience. And that's the thing. It's this experience that Sanderson really nails. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, um, 
Yeah, Phantology, guys. Check them out. This was uh, Ben and Jake, but if you can imagine, there's three more of them out there. So you definitely got to check them out. You guys (laughs) have been dropping a lot of really interesting stuff. That is Stormlight, right? All those chapters that are getting released? Pre-releases. Yeah. Pre-releases. Yeah. The new book comes out next month. So awesome. I've been avoiding them because of spoilers, but I've heard really good things about them. So if you've if you're caught up on Stormlight, definitely check those out. But they've read everything. They've got a back catalog that's definitely worth checking out. So Ben and Ben and Jake, thank you guys so, so much for coming on. We really appreciate the opportunity to have you on the show. We only started a few months ago, too. So to see the support from guys like you, it, it means a lot. So thank you so much for being here with us. Well, thanks for having us. We had a great time. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Yeah, well, let me say thanks too, because okay, you know, okay, 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 at all. <laughs> and I, no, I, we do really appreciate it. <laughs> Great. I'm glad you fought for that moment. <laughs> yeah, I, I need it, Charles. I need it. <laughs> okay, guys. Thanks again, and uh, hopefully we'll have you on again soon. You'll you'll be our resident Cosmere experts. <laughs> I don't know about that, but. <laughs> But we love to come back. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys. Thanks, everybody. And as always, go forth and conquer, friends. <laughs>